program that transcended the technical rivalries of two earthbound superpowers. Suddenly the world began to realize that the immediate goal of landing on the moon was part of a more profound journey for humankind. When two men walked on the lunar surface, so did we all. When humankind claimed the moon in 1969, the Earth was a landscape of war and epic social revolution. But in space, humankind's most noble dreams came into crystal focus. Those few fortunate souls who experienced outer space understood that there was hope in the heavens. That human beings need a relationship with the stars that feeds curiosity instead of competition. A way must be found to shuttle more people into the province of space. These men and women are doing the impossible. They are creating humankind's very first reusable extraterrestrial spaceship. There will be no prefabricated parts, no instruction book. Every element of the project is brand new, poised on the cutting edge of science and imagination. It had always been NASA's intent to create a method of transporting men and materials between Earth and the heavens. But the project accelerated after the conclusion of the Apollo moon missions in the early 1970s. In many ways, the technology behind a space shuttle is more sophisticated than a lunar expedition. In both concept and completion, it is an unprecedented human achievement designed to rocket into Earth orbit at a height of 350 miles, carry up to seven people and 65,000 pounds of freight, perform delicate missions in zero gravity, then land back on the planet's surface like a glider and be prepared to repeat the trip 100 times over. The first practical challenge of the endeavor concerns the vehicle's ability to withstand the 2,500 degree heat of re-entry. When the Apollo astronauts returned from the moon, their command module was protected from incineration by a heat shield of asbestos resin, which burned up upon re-entry. But the shuttle shield must not burn away. Instead, a remarkable new insulating material was developed which can be used on up to 100 excursions to space and back. With the weight and consistency of styrofoam, it is manufactured from an easily obtainable source, sand. The heat dissipating properties of the shuttle's insulation is so efficient, it can be handled while still red hot. The shuttle's 34,000 insulation tiles must be individually milled and fitted to their unique place on the vehicle, covering the ship's aluminum skin, which would otherwise melt at a mere 320 degrees. This requires that each tile have its own code number, which relates to the specific place and curvature of the area for which it was cut, then sprayed with a polymer to avoid absorbing moisture and weight between flights. Like parts of a jigsaw puzzle, shuttle components from contractors across the country flow into the California assembly facility of Rockwell International. This wing section has come from Long Island. Wheel and brake assemblies from Ohio. Flight control system from Florida. Payload bay doors from Oklahoma. And crew living quarters from Colorado. From all across the United States, people have worked at solving the shuttle's construction challenges. From special robotic welding, 
to using lasers to precisely cut insulation from around electrical wiring. There are four separate propulsion systems on the shuttle. Twin rocket boosters support the orbiter and the external tank on the launch pad and supply most of the thrust for blast off and the first two minutes of flight. The main propulsion system, a cluster of three liquid propellant rocket engines supplied with liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen from the external tank. The orbital maneuvering system, two pods mounted on the aft producing propulsion for the final stage of ascent, maneuvering in space and retrofiring for descent. The reaction control system comprised of 44 small rockets mounted in clusters in the nose section and in the two rear pods, which align the shuttle while in orbit. The solid rocket boosters are the largest of their kind ever built, 150 feet long, 12 feet in diameter, assembled from four segments of one half inch steel. The solid propellant inside the casing looks and feels like the hard rubber of a typewriter eraser. After ignition, the boosters will be up to full operating pressure in less than one second, with a combined thrust of nearly three million pounds. The three main engines can swivel 21 degrees up and down in the vertical position and 17 degrees from side to side to steer the vehicle during flight. The liquid hydrogen and oxygen use a propellant stored in the external tank, a structure just over 150 feet long with a diameter of 28 feet, constructed of aluminum alloy up to two inches thick. It is actually two propellant tanks connected by a cylindrical collar called an inner tank. The forward tank holds 140,000 gallons of liquid oxygen at minus 297 degrees Fahrenheit. The aft tank holds 380,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen at minus 420 degrees. Before assembling the final craft, 45 tests at six different facilities were performed to make certain the propulsion system operated perfectly. While the mechanical elements of the craft were being constructed and analyzed, the human element was being prepared inside the most elaborate testing facility ever conceived. The space shuttle represents the combined investments of three decades in space. A generation of scientists and technicians and billions of dollars in hardware. It is important that whoever is finally chosen to represent humankind on a shuttle mission be equipped with intensive training in order to address any known or unknown problem in space. To accomplish this goal, scientists developed the most highly advanced computerized virtual reality device ever created, the SMS. Well, the SMS stands for Shuttle Mission Simulator. That's exactly what it is. It simulates the shuttle mission. We can simulate ascent, on orbit, and entry. We've got all the switches to allow us to do that. This exact high fidelity replica of the shuttle's crew station has seating for the commander, pilot, and two mission specialists to enact team training in an ultra realistic environment. 100 gears down and long. All controls and displays in the motion based simulator are active with visual and audio cues provided for enhancement of the simulation. The simulator takes a little getting used to, especially the uh, motion base. After a few hundred hours in the simulator though, you're, you're fairly comfortable in there and it feels just, just like uh, you're at home and that's exactly what you want. You want to be very comfortable when you strap into the spacecraft. The crew station is mounted on a platform and tilt frame assembly with six independent servo actuators, which create cabin movements similar to what would be experienced on a mission. Outside the motion base simulator is an operator station where technicians prepare the training sessions and monitor the crew's behavior. It's 
kind of funny. The uh, when you get involved in a simulation, you kind of forget that it's a simulation. You tend to mentally think it's the real thing, and you're, you're thinking about it. Your palms start to sweat, and you get nervous, just like it was a real thing. An advanced digital image generation program creates the high fidelity window scenes, processing and displaying three dimensional scenes for all windows of the crew station. A team of instructors is assigned to each flight crew. Ironically, instructors help improve performance by causing in-flight 